Jenny is going to come and just share the word of God with us this morning. And we'll just pray with the folks. Lord, we thank you that you, you are a God that um, you've written things down for us to, so that we can know you in, in an intimate way. And Lord, that you just speak through this vessel this morning, that you would open Jenny's mouth, your words of wisdom and revelation, Lord, a channel of, um, for you, Lord Jesus, that you would be glorified, that Christ would be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A few weeks ago, um, those of you who were here, Joyce gave a word and she reminded us of a woman in the Bible who sought out Jesus so she could just touch the hem of his garment and be healed. And she wanted to be healed, but without him noticing her um, and without the crowd noticing her. And she wanted to be anonymous. And Joyce just beautifully brought out how Jesus wanted to see her face to face it was a lovely point she brought out. Just a beautiful picture of an encounter with Jesus. And she was healed, yes. That was a real blessing, certainly. But she also had this very real encounter with Jesus, which was very personal and precious. And I've been thinking about that a lot. And I've been thinking about others who were really surprised by Jesus. Um, throughout the Gospels and into Acts, we've got many, many people who were surprised with Jesus when they met him. There were those who wanted to see him, wanted to meet him, wanted to hear what he had to say. And there were others who'd never heard of him. And yet Jesus knew all about them and he brought about an encounter with them. So I was thinking about people like the woman at the well and earlier in Jesus' ministry, people like Nathaniel. Neither of them had heard of Jesus, but he arranged a meeting with them and totally impacted their lives. So I'm just going to look today at a few people and how they were surprised by Jesus. So if you want a title, it's Surprised by Jesus. And the first one is a well-known story. It's Zacchaeus, and it's in Luke chapter 19. And it's verses 1 to 10, and I'll just read them. It says, he, that's Jesus, so that's Luke 19, 1 to 10. He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus hurry and come down for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. So here is a tax collector, not just any tax collector, but a chief tax collector. And he's working for the Romans, not for his Jewish community. So he's seen as a traitor. The community didn't like him. He was working for the occupying force, if you like. He was rich, but we're not quite sure how he was rich because many tax collectors, as you know, were corrupt. So had he gained his riches through corrupt means, we don't know. He wasn't very tall, we're told. He certainly wasn't very popular. But Zacchaeus was trying to see Jesus. <laughs> had he heard of him previously, or had he just seen the commotion in the crowd? Again, we're not told. But certainly he knew somebody was coming, somebody important was coming along the road. And because of the crowd, and because he was small, he couldn't see him. So he ran on ahead, as we read there, and climbed into the tree. He was curious. He just wanted to look and to see this man all the crowds were following. He wasn't planning to speak to him, as far as we know. And he wasn't expecting this man, this Jesus, to stop and speak to him. He was expecting Jesus to keep on walking by. Because it says he was passing through Jericho. Jesus was actually on his way somewhere. But Jesus did stop 
and he did speak to Zacchaeus and he invited himself to his house. He says, hurry and come down for I must come down. I must stay at your house. And it says in verse 6 that Zacchaeus hurried and received him gladly. Now, apparently that word for gladly in the original, it meant, literally meant rejoicing. So he wasn't just slightly happy, he was extremely happy. <laughs> he was rejoicing that Jesus wanted to come to his house. He was surprised by Jesus. But he wasn't the only one. The crowds, they all began to grumble, saying, he's gone to the house of a guest. He's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. They were certainly really surprised by Jesus. Of all the people in Jericho, why did Jesus pick to go to Zacchaeus' house? You see, Jesus can see beyond, as we know, the externals and the superficial. He can see beyond the person's present lifestyle, even their past behaviours. And he can see beyond that. And in the presence of Jesus, Zacchaeus was changed. His life was impacted. So he was surprised by Jesus, and so was the crowd. Then I was thinking about the disciples. Just think about it. As they followed and walked with Jesus for those three years, they had many surprises. They were surprised by who he spoke to. For example, they were surprised when he spoke to that woman at the well, the woman of Samaria. They were surprised that he even talked to a woman as a man. They were surprised even more because she was a Samaritan and Jews and Samaritans didn't mix. They were surprised when Jesus allowed the children to come to him. They were very surprised. Let's have a little look at some of these. Matthew 19, 13 to 15. Matthew 19, 13 to 15 says this. Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. After laying his hands on them, he departed from there. So there were the children. The parents wanted them to come to Jesus. They were bringing them to Jesus. It even says in another account that it's the babies as well. It wasn't just young children, but the babies too. They were expecting Jesus to do something, to pray with them. But it was the disciples who were surprised. And actually, it says the disciples rebuked them. That's quite stern, isn't it? They said, don't do that. Don't bother Jesus. You know, he's... Basically, they were saying the children aren't that important. And if you read the account in Mark's gospel, it's Mark 10, 13, it says Jesus was indignant. He wasn't happy about it. And they were surprised by his words. In Mark 10, 15, it says, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. Jesus was interested in the children and through the children was teaching a spiritual lesson. This is the disciples thought it's the intelligent, it's the adults, it's the important ones, people of stature that Jesus would be interested in. And yes, he's interested in them, but he's also interested in the nobodies of this world and the little ones. Jesus wants us to trust him with the simplicity and faith and trust of a little child. And then I was thinking about one of the most beautiful parts of the Bible, the woman caught in adultery. And we'll look at this, it's John chapter 8. So John's Gospel chapter 8. And it's from verse 1 to 11. And there was something I'd never seen before, but I'll bring that out after I've read it. So John's Gospel chapter 8, 1 to 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the centre of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this to test him, so that they might have grounds to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, but when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. 
Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out, one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone, and the woman, where she was, in the centre of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, from now on sin no more. I think this is one of the most beautiful encounters in the Gospels. I've never seen before, though I've read it many times, that this took place in the temple. It actually took place, I'd always imagined it was as Jesus was walking along the road, but no, it was in the temple. It says in the court, the scribes and Pharisees brought this woman to test him. So yes, these scribes and Pharisees wanted to meet Jesus and see Jesus, but not for the right reasons at all. They wanted to accuse him. They wanted to know, is he going to stone this woman? Or is he going to break the law of Moses? They wanted to trick him either way. They weren't even interested in the woman. This is what is so shocking. A person's life was on the line here. She could have been stoned to death. And they weren't, they weren't worried about the justice or anything. And but They just wanted to trick Jesus. They couldn't care less about the treatment of the woman, so it appears. They just said, what do you say? That was all they were interested in. What did Jesus say? And again, not for the right reasons. They were trying to trick him. It's all right to know what would Jesus say about something if we genuinely want to know his answer, but not if we want to trick him. But Jesus didn't answer them. And they kept persisting in answering and asking him. But then they got a really big shock. He said, let him who is out without sin cast the first stone. Hang on a minute here, they must have thought. Jesus has turned the tables. Instead of talking about the woman's sin, he was now talking about their sin. He totally turned the tables. I love that. Wow. Suddenly it wasn't about the woman. That was about all of them. It says he straightened up and he said to them, I like to think that Jesus, with his piercing pure eyes, was just looking at them as he said it, you know? And what could they do? Before the pure, holy Jesus, even the smallest sin becomes noticeable in our lives. And they just went away. And it says from the oldest to the youngest. Yeah, sometimes we can be so impulsive as young people, can't we? And a bit more dogmatic and, and wisdom as we get older. And then Jesus wrote down again in the ground with no idea what he wrote. And then his eyes looked at the woman. It's amazing, isn't it? She was certainly surprised, wasn't she? She had come, if you like. She hadn't volunteered to meet with Jesus. She was brought. <laughs> she, she really didn't want to come. She was expecting shame, harsh rebuke, judgment, harsh judgment. She was expecting death. She was expecting that angry mob. Maybe she was expecting a just punishment for her sin. She knew she'd done wrong. She was expecting rejection, rejection, and she was, I'm sure, in fear and trembling. But what did she receive? Mercy, Amen. forgiveness, <laughs> life and love, a new life, a new path, a new way. Amazing. I've often wondered, how did that woman rebuild her life? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, she'd been publicly humiliated and exposed. The whole community would know what she had done. How did she rebuild her life? I've, I've often wondered that. Did, did she, was, she, if she, was she was married? Did she go back to her husband? You know, what did she do after this encounter with Jesus? But we're not told. But I'm absolutely sure of this, that Jesus' words, from now on, sin no more, I bet she obeyed those. I bet she said, wow, I have been totally forgiven here. I've got, and I've got a new start. And so her encounter with Jesus was a huge surprise. Uh, earlier this week, I was discussing with some others, some of the ladies, the scripture in Romans 2, 4 about the kindness of God. And Romans 2, 4 says this, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? And we talked about how God's kindness it's a kindness that he wants us to change, you know? And I'm sure the mercy, love, and kindness that Jesus offered the woman resulted in a completely new lifestyle. 
But then, let's look at someone else who was wanting to see Jesus. I'm sure you can think of many, but we're going to consider maybe an unusual one. We're going to consider Herod. In Luke 23, verses 6 to 12, that's Luke 23, 6 to 12. This is in the day in the day before Jesus is going to be crucified. I mean, Jesus is being brought before Pilate. Um, the, the Jewish leaders are accusing him of things. Um, Pilate found out that he was from Galilee, so he said, right, I'll send him to Herod, um, because that was Herod's jurisdiction. And Luke 23, from verse six says this when Pilate heard it he asked whether the man was a Galilean and when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction he sent him to Herod who himself also was in Jerusalem at the time now Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus for he had wanted to see him for a long time because he'd been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him and he questioned him at length but he answered him nothing and the chief priests and the scribes were standing there, accusing him vehemently. And Herod, with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. So it says there that Herod, for a long time, had been wanting to see Jesus. He'd heard about him, and he wanted to see a, a sign. He was curious, wasn't he? Yeah. Very curious. But... What was his curiosity about? It was just for a sign, wasn't it? A spectacle. You know, Jesus never rejected people coming to him for healing when we read about it or for an answer to prayer. He never rejected them. You think of the centurion asking him to heal his servant or the Syrophoenician woman and her daughter who was very persistent or Jairus and his daughter. Think of Bartimaeus. Jesus never rejected any of them. But he never performed a miracle or sign just to entertain or to satisfy curiosity like Herod. Herod wanted him to perform a sign, but he wasn't going to do that. No, I'm sure Herod was very surprised. Here's Herod, King Herod, lots of power. And there Jesus doesn't do what he wants at all. Jesus was definitely surprised by Jesus. <laughs> Herod was definitely surprised by Jesus. And do you know, it's awful. What does he do? It says he treats him with contempt and mocked him. He doesn't even have the decency, you know, to, to, to treat him well. Contempt and mocking. Dressing him in a gorgeous robe, i.e. mocking the fact that Jesus was a king. It wasn't what he was expected, expecting when he met Jesus at all. So today, as we read these things, what are we thinking about? I'm thinking about some of the encounters I've had <laughs> with Jesus over the years. And the most important one is the day of salvation, accepting Jesus. That's, that is the most wonderful thing. That is not what I was expecting to happen that day. I was surprised. <laughs> but that's when I was led to the Lord, and that was wonderful. But with, as we continue with him, we're continually having meetings with him and experiencing things daily. And we can think about these characters we've looked at in the Bible, these true characters, they were surprised. The disciples were surprised, surprised by maybe what was in their hearts when they were rejecting their children. The crowds were surprised that, you know, they hadn't thought this man was very important when Jesus went to see Zacchaeus. All the scribes and Pharisees were surprised by the mercy of God, weren't they? Yeah. And I was thinking about how God wants to, to do things in our hearts even today. I remember I was talking to Norman yesterday, um, once when I was doing some training to do with my nursing, it was about promoting health with a certain group of people who were quite marginalised in society. And we were actually up in Inverary at the, it was nice, it was in a hotel <laughs> to do this training. And as soon as we arrived, I went to the ladies. And there was a lady who greeted me, said hello, she was at the mirror and everything. And I, I had this thought in my head, I wonder what she's doing here. She just didn't seem to fit in, right? She was the speaker. <laughs> she was the speaker. And it shocked me that I had had that thought. Because the very reason we were going to this meeting was not to reject people, <laughs> you know, but to, to, you know, and I was, I was, oh gosh, Jenny, is that in your heart? 
you know? <laughs> so I was surprised just by her appearance. I just mm -hmm. rejected her. How awful was that? Um, I, I think of other times when God's revealed the secrets of my heart. And um, sometimes it's been uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but it's always been beneficial. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to tell you two others. Um, one example was I was in a ladies' meeting, and um, there was a, a young girl there who was probably ten, yeah, at least 10 years younger than me. She was a teenager. I was in my mid-teens. This girl oozed confidence. And as a very shy person then, I didn't, didn't find that easy that somebody so young could have all this confidence. And I once had found her a little bit rude. And so, Anyway, so at the end of the meeting, we were having, people were having prayer, and a lady was praying with this young girl. And there was lovely things. She was praying almost prophetically over this girl's life. And inside I was thinking, gosh, that lady doesn't know what this girl's like, Lord, right? I, I'm ashamed to admit it. And immediately as this lady was praying, she said, the Lord says, I've even given you your personality. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> I said, oh, Lord, forgive me. So, you know, God can really put his finger on things, can't he? Mm -hmm. So that was one time when I said, okay, Lord, I, I need to accept that not everybody that I find easy <laughs> is wrong. It's maybe me that needs to change. You know, God's got a purpose for this girl. And she actually is doing a work for the Lord. I found out many years later. And she maybe needed to be that confident person that I didn't relate to, you know. And then I think also of another ladies' meeting I was in. And the lady who'd spoken, she was praying with people. And she was just standing at the front again, sort of asking, what does the Lord want to do in our lives today? And, and um, she talked about forgiveness, you know, forgiving people, how important that is. And so I was sort of standing there with my eyes closed. And I was sort of searching my heart, saying, Lord, is there anybody that I still need to forgive because I, as a young Christian, I'd sort of gone through and tried to forgive everybody I needed to. And so I was thinking, is there anyone else, Lord? And I thought, I can't think of anyone else I need to forgive, Lord. And then the thought came to me, actually, I think I need to forgive myself, right? And again, immediately I thought that, the speaker said, in fact, there are some people here today who need to forgive themselves. Wow. Again, so encounters with Jesus, sometimes they can be uncomfortable, other times they can be total blessings, they can be a surprise, but they're always for our benefit that we will walk with him more closely. And it's wonderful because that was a release. Yes, I forgave myself. Instead of feeling guilty over things in the past, mm -hmm. I, I forgave myself because the Lord had forgiven me. <clears throat> so what does he want to do with us today? We spoke earlier, I said about people like Nathaniel, who ultimately became a disciple of Jesus. He was surprised that Jesus knew all about him. So what does he want to do today? Has he got a calling on our lives? I was thinking about this. This is something that's been dormant for a while, that we need to let the Lord rise up again in us, or some sort of calling. Is there some job he wants us to do? Um, is there a healing, a rebuke for our benefit? Is there more training and teaching? What does he want to do? We might be surprised by the people Jesus is interested in. And we might be surprised that he's interested in us. Amen. That is that is the thing. He's interested in you and he's interested in me. So I wonder as, as I finish if we could just close our eyes and just think about these things and we'll just pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you've recorded these things down for us that we may learn from them. And that you definitely want to work in people's lives. You do not reject anyone, Lord. And Father, as we've thought about these things, help us to allow you to work in our lives, Lord. Whether it's coming to you for the first time, asking Jesus to forgive us and to save us, giving our lives to him. Or whether, Lord, it's allowing you to do a work in us in a deeper way. A work in me, Lord, in a deeper way. Father, we know that we can have an encounter with you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Even yes. every day, Lord, yes. we yes. know that we can be surprised by you, by what you want to do, Lord, and what you are doing. Mm -hmm. Father, we just want to give our lives afresh into your hands. I want to give my life afresh mm -hmm. into your hands mm -hmm. this day, asking you to continue to work in us, Lord, and through us. Mm -hmm. For the blessing of others, Lord, and so that we please you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I rest my 
my soul on Jesus when the mountains shake I put my trust in Jesus the moment I awake and when my soul is lost at sea He will be my rock My vision be in Christ alone This grace is all we've got His love is like the mighty old his love for me will never stop Oh, His arms are strong enough to carry me Through it all by the grace of God So I upon His shoulders say The King of broken hearts His love is like the mighty ocean Trust in Jesus the more.